Well, I'm really excited to welcome everyone here today to the first Roads to Removal event to take place in the United States. We are really thrilled to bring the findings of this report out into the public and to start to interrogate them, have a conversation about how we bring sort of this guiding light that can tell us how to do what we need to do when it comes to removing carbon dioxide and make it a reality. Um, so my name is James Lawler. I'm the founder of Climate Now, climatenow.com. This is a educational multimedia platform. We produce a weekly podcast, videos, and we partner with other organizations on events like these. And we are partners with the Livermore Lab Foundation. Uh, Susan Houghton and Sally Allen, thank you so much for spearheading this effort and for enabling everything that we're going to do today. Um, the foundation is a partner to the Lawrence Livermore National Lab and enables a lot of variety of research efforts there as well as other things. Um, and you know, most research reports do not get this treatment, right? And so we are extreme, we have, we have a, a huge, uh, you know, we owe a huge amount to these, uh, these, these organizations here on the screen. So ClimateWorks Foundation, Breakthrough Energy, and the Grantham Foundation who've made this rollout possible. So thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Jan Mazurik cannot make it today from ClimateWorks Foundation, but we owe her a, a round of applause. Thank you to all of our supporters and everyone to make this possible. Thank you. So I'd like to just uh, run through some just a, oh, let's see, sorry about that. Okay, so um, event information here, speaker bios, you can access them at any time via that QR code. If you need uh, translation services, we have that as well. And if you'd like to actually download this report, we're gonna be referring to chapters in the report throughout the day. And if you're curious, you can, you can find it there. And if you, you can also go to roads to removal, the number two, org and download the executive summary, the data, uh, and the entire and the report. It's in in its entirety. So with that, um, I'd like to start by playing a, a short video, and um, and then we'll we'll get into the day. I guess I'll say one thing, which is the point of today is to develop understanding. So as you're hearing things, think about your questions, write them down. The panels, when we, we're going to hear from speakers and we're going to hear from the authors of this report um, in, in section by section, and then we're going to have panel discussions where we really get into it and try to understand it. So think about your questions, write them down. This is going to be interactive, um, and we're going to have a lot of fun um, getting to know roads to removal. So thank you. Let's play the video. The United States has set a target to produce net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in an effort to minimize the impacts of climate change as much as possible. Now, reaching that goal will require rapid adoption of renewable energy, electrification of machines and vehicles, and improving efficiency wherever possible. But even with such efforts, we will still need to remove hundreds of millions or even a billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere every year by the middle of this century. So how are we going to do it? That's the question that a national team of scientists, led by researchers at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and sponsored by the Department of Energy, set out to answer in their recent report, Roads to Removal. I am James Lawler, Climate Now, and together with the Livermore Lab Foundation, we sat down with the report's lead authors to understand what they've discovered. Dr. Jennifer Petridge is a senior staff scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and she led the multidisciplinary team that created the Roads to Removal Report. The Roads to Removal Report is a national scale assessment of carbon dioxide removal. It's conducted at a county level, and we're assessing both the capacity and the costs for removing CO2 from the atmosphere in various different ways. So to conduct this analysis, we brought together experts from all across this country. And together, these individuals helped us really analyze existing data and model what we think is likely to happen over the coming 30 years. Our team at Lawrence Livermore made an analysis for the state of California a couple of years ago that showed that absolutely we could achieve the goals that our state had set. But then we started to ask, can we do that as a nation? And where are the specific opportunities to achieve CDR or carbon dioxide removal targets using different technologies, 
because every place has a different opportunity and different costs. The report examines four key methods of carbon dioxide removal, increasing forests and improving forest management practices, improving soil management on croplands, capturing CO2 in biomass and converting that biomass to form new products and prevent CO2 release, and capturing CO2 directly from air using direct air capture machines paired with renewable energy. The report also examines how much CO2 captured from biomass or directly from the air could be safely transported and stored deep underground, permanently preventing it from re-entering the atmosphere. In 2021, the U.S. Department of Energy launched the Carbon Negative Shot, a challenge to identify and scale technologies that can collectively remove at least a billion tons of CO2 annually for an average price of less than $100 per ton of CO2 removed. What Dr. Petridge and her team found is that there are multiple ways to meet that challenge. The big takeaway from this report is we can achieve upwards of a billion tons of CO2 removals from the atmosphere in this country. And we can do that affordably. But it is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Every region has a different story to tell. And so it will take policy and changes that are happening locally and engagement between the public and private sectors to achieve that gigaton or more. So one other really important aspect of this project and our takeaway message is there are things we can do today. There are things we can do right away in terms of removing using what we call ecological solutions. And these are our forests and the way that we manage our agricultural soils. We can be achieving something near 100 million tons of CO2 removals by the year 2050. There are others like converting biomass to products and capturing CO2 using a direct air capture. That's gonna take real investment and capital expenditures that will take decades to implement. So there's a, both a near-term opportunity and a long-term opportunity. Of course, decarbonizing our energy supply, as well as decarbonizing our transportation, agriculture, and industrial sectors is the top priority in the United States. It is critically important for our national net zero emissions goals and our global climate commitments. But even when we have done our best to decarbonize everything, there will still be some emissions. There will still be legacy emissions. There will still be sectors that cannot be decarbonized. That's what these roads to carbon dioxide removal can address. Even if we did every bit of decarbonizing that we could, there is still a need to remove something on the order of a billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's where this report is so important. So essentially this boils down to do our best and remove the rest. Roads to Removal is an opportunity to take the next steps to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Every region in the nation has an opportunity. Every region has a story. To learn more about the potential for each carbon removal approach or to download the report, visit roads2removal.org. All right. And with that, I'd love to introduce Dr. Jennifer Petridge from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, Dr. Petridge is a senior staff scientist at the lab. She is also an adjunct professor here at UC Merced. Uh, Dr. Petridge is a soil geochemist uh, as well as uh, studies the microbiology of soils and how carbon is retained in, in, the, in soil. Um, Dr. Petridge has also authored over 150 peer-reviewed articles that have been cited over 10,000 times. Can you imagine being cited, quoted 10,000 times by your peers? Dr. Petridge has indeed achieved that. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Petridge. All right, well, again, welcome everyone. It's, it's really thrilling to be here. As James just mentioned, I am adjunct professor in life and environmental sciences here at UC Merced, and so I have connections to um, many students and many of the faculty here that are, it just really feels um, special to be starting uh, the rollout of this report here. So um, I wanna just start to, to dig in. Um, for those of you who were here last night, um, I'm gonna reinforce some messages that maybe you already heard, so you'll recognize a few of the slides, but. Hopefully the, um, you can take on board some new information. There are 
a, a large team of folks who contributed to this report, more than I can really fit on the title slide. So 68 of us really worked together on this effort, initially funded by the Department of Energy with some foundation support as well. So I wanna start with credit to those individuals and many, many of the lead authors are here in the room and I really wanna um, thank them for their dedication for pulling this data together. So let's start with the problem, which as we well know is that we have far too much CO2 in our atmosphere and that is contributing to a greenhouse effect, it's contributing to climate change. Um, we had a wonderful talk from Tamara Geze last night who explained all of the, the physics and the mechanics of what that's doing to our planet. I'm gonna assume that you know much of that already and you know the destructive changes that have already started to happen and are coming, I'm afraid. But what the International Panel on Climate Change tells us is that to limit um, warming to a well, <laughs> a, a level that we can live with um, as human society, we really must start to remove um, those emissions. We must stop um, emitting the um, billions of tons of CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide. So that's what we talk about when we talk about decarbonization, is moving away from fossil fuels, moving to renewable energy sources, and that takes us from where we are um, um, kind of at a baseline down to where we hope to be in 2050. Now, when you look at these curves, <laughs> I kind of like to make the joke that something about the shape of these curves make it look easy. Like we're just gonna get on the slide at the water park and just slide on down to zero. And I gotta tell you, it is going to be hard. That um, the removal and the transformation of our economy that is necessary to simply stop those emissions is massive. And that is the big thing that our government and that all of um, governments around the, the world that have signed the Paris Agreement are investing in. That is where the bulk of the financial investment has been to date. But even if we remove as much as we can of our emissions, we will not likely get all the way to zero because there are sectors that we simply don't yet know how to stop emitting from, and agriculture is a large part of that, but there are materials that steel and cement and others that are very, very difficult to completely decarbonize, to, to make without some amount of fossil inputs. So how do we make up for that? Well, that's where carbon dioxide removal, or the acronym that we sometimes call CDR, comes in. It's the green area underneath the zero line in this plot. We need to literally suck carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it durably. Durable storage can mean soils, and that can be for 20 to 100 years, or it could be within deep geological formations, miles beneath the surface of the earth, where we know we can store it for thousands of years, probably even more. So that process really is what makes the math work for us to get to net zero. There's some amount we can't stop emitting, there's some amount that we can remove from the atmosphere. And that amount that we're targeting, as, as we just saw in the video, the White House tells us needs to be around a billion tons by the time we get to 2050. Let's not wait till then, let's start tomorrow, even if it's in the millions, but we want to eventually get to a billion. That's what the Department of Energy has also set as their Earthshot goal on the scale of what we did back when I was a child in, in the moonshot, right? So this is at the level of um, uh, attention in our government that um, some of those efforts were at. So many of you may know that um, Lawrence Livermore and colleagues at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and elsewhere published a report um, back in 2018, led by my colleague Sarah Baker, who's here, which was focused on the state of California. Our governor had set 2045 as the goal to get the state to carbon neutrality, and we did an analysis of, can we do it? What would it cost? What would be involved? A really kind of very pragmatic analysis, and showed, yep, can be done, here's how you do it. And that has inspired um, a lot of folks, I think, in the state. There's been some legislative changes, and I think we're moving in that direction. It's really exciting. But we're just one state in the nation. And so more recently, um, with colleagues at Livermore, we pitched an idea to the Department of Energy to do this for the nation. Let's look at every county, over 3,000 counties across the country, 
and ask what is the capacity, what's it going to cost to do the carbon dioxide removal to get to a billion tons. So that's where, we're, where we are today. We have done the report. We have released it back in December. It's a national analysis. It, it took a national group of folks to contribute to this. So folks from um, almost 15 different institutions, and as I said, um, nearly 70 different authors. So county level data and bottom up analysis. How is that different from what you've seen before if you've read different national or even international reports? Much of what we learn from the IPCC and these global organizations tends to be created using integrated assessment models, which are excellent, but they make a lot of assumptions. We started from the data that already exists, the data that is collected by our forest service, by the soil survey, um, that's collected on demographics, where jobs are, socioeconomics. We collected this data as well as the technical information that our team is expert in and used that to parameterize additional models that we use to essentially calculate what's possible in each place, knowing the biomass that exists, knowing the land that exists, where there's water, all of these resources. It's a very cross-cutting kind of analysis. We made sure that there was renewable energy and new renewable energy to fuel all of the new facilities that would need to be built. So we really put a, as many guardrails around the analysis as we could to be conservative um, about our assumptions for the system. We included something that I'm really excited and proud of that has never been included before, and that's an assessment of the equity, the environmental um, justice effects of implementing these approaches. We need to make sure that we are involved in what they call the just transition, meaning we are not exacerbating historical inequality, whether that's socioeconomic, whether that's um, degradation of our environment or our own health. So we wanted to include those data as part of the analysis, and, and we did do so. The last thing I'll say is this is very clearly not meant to be a finger wagging, a policy recommendation. We are here to say this is the data. We want to engage with communities that would be affecting these approaches and hear from you. Hear from you if we're right and if there are things that we didn't know because you live here in Merced County and you have unique information about this place. So our policymakers will need to be likely, our policymakers and um, folks in industry and the ag sector, folks who are involved in environmental justice will need to make the decisions in the long run. And what we hope is this report gives you the data that you need to make those, those, those choices. So let me walk you through the analysis. We start with CO2 in our atmosphere. That CO2 is fixed by plants. I like to say last night that the plants are the, the OG of, of carbon capture because photosynthesis is really the best way we still know of capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. Thankfully, they do it for free. We have to give them a little nitrogen and, of course, some water, which is a real issue here in the Central Valley. But we can fix carbon in cropland plants and then in those soils. We can also fix carbon in forest biomass. That is, uh, those are the first two ecological solutions that we looked at in our analysis. Now, when cropland soils are planted with um, plants, uh, some of them have high biomass that can be grown on very poor soils, marginal lands. Some of these native prairie grasses like switchgrass or miscanthus, um, we can actually harvest that biomass and convert it into useful products and fuels. We can do the same with this, uh, leftover forest biomass, the waste materials that aren't going into lumber and the other things that we use the wood for. So that biomass, that woody biomass or crop biomass can be very useful. And we can convert that into a lot of different ways. That biomass can also come from municipal waste, originally from plants as well, but it's the stuff you put in your green bin right, the leftover foods, products, um, as well as the leftovers from um, agricultural um, activities. And as we likely know here in um, uh, Merced, a lot of the materials that used to be burned on the land 
We can't do that anymore for very rightful reasons, but that material now has to be trucked off site. So there's a lot of organic residues to kind of lump it all together that we literally have to truck to the landfill right now. So what if instead we trucked it to a biorefinery that was doing gasification or fermentation or pyrolysis and making a product while first and foremost capturing carbon? So that's a technique that we call BIKERS, or Biomass Carbon Removal and Storage. The acronym is important. What is important is the carbon capture. And a secondary product might be making a fuel like hydrogen. At the same time, that carbon that's captured, we need to store it. We need to lock it away. And as I mentioned earlier, we can do that by putting it deep, deep below ground in geologic formations where it's stable and safe for millennia, really. The last process that we can study and, and under, can use to understand and to capture carbon from the atmosphere is called direct air capture. And often when we hear CDR or carbon dioxide removal, this is actually what people are talking about. It's the most expensive, it's the most um, uh, widely talked about, but direct air capture um, is essentially using chemistry to pull CO2 from the air and then, again, storing that supercritically um, um, uh, collected CO2 in, a, in geologic storage formations. So that's what we looked at. We really um, tried, again, to look at the environmental effects both on human health and the environmental um, uh, health uh, for all of these different pathways. This is a, a figure that many have shown that um, has been reprinted many times, and I, I want to just illustrate that we only looked at four of the um, currently well-described methods for carbon dioxide removal. There are many roads not traveled <laughs> in our report, meaning there are folks who are really excited about marine carbon capture, really excited about adding rock dust to our agricultural fields to, to pull down CO2, looking at wetlands. But we kept to just four because we felt they were the most mature, they are the technologies we feel confident could be in place by 2050 or sooner, and we had the data. We really couldn't do a bottom-up analysis of a technique where we didn't have the data. So that's why we focused on the forests, on our soils, on bikers or biomass conversion, and on direct air capture. So let me dig in a little bit on the specific results. First, the high level. Absolutely, we can do this. We can achieve a billion tons or a gigaton of removals by the time we get to 2050. So we can meet the goal. We can actually go way beyond the goal. <laughs> but we chose to calibrate our numbers to that, uh, that goal that the White House established. It's going to cost $129 billion per year. And I think that number sometimes sounds like a big one. Uh, it's uh, roughly, though, $130 a ton. And I would pose the question of, what other commodity can you imagine that you can buy for $130 a ton? You think of anything? The one that I know is sand, rock, <laughs> high quality sand. There's not many more that you can, so it's, I don't know, put it in that light and it seems like a reasonable number. It's also, half of 1% of our current GDP. I think that the numbers will likely come down, but even at that rate, it's dwarfed by the cost that climate change is causing to our lives, to our homes, to our ecosystems, so which are in the trillions. The other benefit of, these, of this removal is the jobs that it will create. So we um, calculate on uh, an estimate of 440,000 new jobs will be created in these industries. And I recognize that as we transition away from fossil fuel loose, loss, excuse me, fossil fuel use, that there will be job losses. And these are in some ways um, uh, happening in, in places where, where that um, has occurred. So we wanted to look at how do we get from here to 2050? And this analysis, would, I'll admit, is very back of the envelope at this point because it's hard to know how the investment and the policy decisions will be made between now and 2050. But what I'm here to tell you is those ecological approaches where we are managing our forests and our soils, we can start tomorrow, literally. We know exactly what to do. It will take initiative, it will take funding. 
but we know how to manage our forests to pull biomass that is um, um, not needed in those forests and often creates to fire risk. We know how to manage our soils. Getting the, the facilities built for bikers and for direct air capture will take more time, but we're confident we can do that by 2050. And it's important to recognize that while the per year rate of removals in the agricultural management, in the forest management, they're low. They're in the millions of tons per year. But this cumulative effect is significant. So again, let's not wait for some panacea solution that appears in 2050. We really need to start now. So this slide doesn't look like it should. I'm sorry about that, but that's OK. This is our cost curve. And what you should see here is um, a whole series of different um, capacities for the different solutions we've proposed. Now, if it looks the way you should, on the, the left-hand side there, you'd see there are several short bars that are very cheap, affordable approaches. And that's our soils. That's our forest management. You can actually make money by removing biomass from forests in some places in the country. The cost for carbon removal and storage in our soils can be in the tens of dollars. The next sort of big chunk of removals is really the biggest one, and that's removing by a biomass conversion. There are a lot of different ways to do that, and I'll go into that later. But probably the biggest effort initially is to convert that biomass to hydrogen. You think about what biomass is made of. It's made of carbon, of oxygen, and hydrogen. If we're pulling off the hydrogen for a fuel, we're left with CO2. And that CO2 can be stored. And we can do that relatively affordably. That, the, the big um, 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 uh, block there that kind of looks pink is gasification to hydrogen. And that, again, I apologize that the figure didn't show up. But that's about a, roughly $100 a ton. There are some additional approaches that we'll need, and we discussed with the DOE that we really better include gasification um, to a sustainable airline fuel. And that ends up being about $120, $140 a ton. And then finally, on the right-hand side of the slide, and again, you can't see it, but direct air capture is going to be needed as well to get us to a billion tons. And that can be up near about $200 a ton. We can actually get all the way to 14 billion tons of removals per year if we went all in on direct air capture. It would be up near $250 a ton, and that's a price point that right now is not really considered acceptable. But I bet you by the time we get there that Simon Pang and colleagues around the country will have brought those costs down because they're studying lots of new ways to do direct air capture. So the, what I really want you to take away from is that we have more than enough capacity, which means that we've got choices on how we apply these approaches. So I'm going to start with talking a little bit about forests. We looked at forest um, management across the country in three specific regions, New England, the south southeastern forest, where we can do essentially plantation rotation. It's almost like a cropping system. I'm going to really focus here in the West, on the, the fire-prone forests of the Western United States. And the costs are really quite affordable, 40 so dollars a ton. And in the Southeast, even a net revenue of roughly $40 a ton for removals and forest management. And what can be a little counterintuitive here is that we're managing forests by taking timber, by taking trees out of the forest. But it makes the remaining trees healthier. It makes it less prone to burning. So you actually get carbon removal on net when you, when you do the math. And that biomass that you've taken out of the forest, well, we know we have other useful uses for that that I'll talk about in a moment. So per year, something on the order of 72 million tons of CO2 removals. Now, soils, and I got to admit, this is the, the place where my heart is. This is where my expertise is. But um, my colleague, Allegra Mayer, and, and, and others um, did these analyses, and they had to make some tough de decisions. They chose to look at three key approaches, planting cover crops, which are crops that you plant in the wintertime, outside of the time of year when you've got a cash crop. Or uh, here in Merced County, you might have orchards, and you have a cover crop that's in, in between those rows. And those cover crops ideally have a root system that's thick and lush and is literally helping that plant act as a pump for carbon and putting it into the ground. That cover crop is also 
holding the soil and preventing erosion. It can have a nitrogen fixing activity so that we need less fertilizer. There are lots of good things about cover crops. They sometimes sound easy. It's really technically difficult though to know exactly when to plant and to know when to harvest, to, to chop your cover crop, whether to till. It's not uh, something that's practiced by every farmer across our country, even though it sounds like a win-win. Actually, only about 6% of the farms across our nation are using cover cropping, but we think that that could be incentivized to be a much larger number. We also looked at perennials. Perennial plants grow year after year after year. Our orchard trees, of course, are perennial. And because they keep their roots in the ground year on year, they keep pumping the carbon below ground. You can put perennials around the edges of a, of a field, and sometimes we call that a hedgerow or a windbreak, and just that little bit of keeping the roots pumping carbon below ground actually can, on, the, on average, increase soil carbon. We can also, as I mentioned, plant marginal lands with these carbon crops where we might be harvesting above ground. But I'll tell you, when I've dug some deep soil pits in a perennial uh, switchgrass plot, we went down to three meters. Those roots kept going. I gave up. But they're really effective at putting carbon in the ground. So it really depends on what we decide to pay the producers and in terms of how much carbon can be captured. If the set point is $40 a ton, we think that we can achieve something like a million, sorry, 130 million tons of CO2 removals by 2050. If we pay that farmer $100 a ton, it, that number is close up to a billion tons of removals through carbon management and soils. So we gotta really think about the economics. We're not asking anybody to do anything for free, and the incentives are based, to be honest, on the money. So, the next step I wanna talk about is biomass conversion. And this, as I said, is the, the big opportunity really in our nation across the country. We estimate something between 700 and 900 uh, million tons of removals per year by the time we get to 2050. This takes what we think of as uh, forest slash or residues. It can be agricultural materials, whether that's corn stover, walnut hulls, um, all of those materials that would get either burned or just left to decompose. Again, everything in your green bin, the municipal solid waste is substantial in our cities, as well as those carbon crops. All of that biomass is a, an enormous amount that is produced year on year. And if that is transported to a facility that can convert it and capture that carbon, we have an enormous opportunity to do carbon dioxide removal. We set a lot of guardrails around this process. We really avoided any kind of land use change. We don't wanna take land that we are currently growing food and put it into these biomass crops. That's, that was one of our first rules. It would on whole require 300 new biorefineries across the United States. Those don't exist right now. It's gonna take money and time to, to, to create those facilities, and we recognize that. So that's why this doesn't kick in until year 2050. And uh, Sarah Baker and her team looked at a whole suite of different ways to process that biomass. They used a techno-economic analysis, which just means essentially counting all of the parts <laughs> of the process, trucking the biomass to a facility, moving the CO2 to a geologic reservoir, all of the different um, um, techniques that are used to convert that biomass, whether it's combusting it, literally just burning it, or looking at a fermentation, a gasification, a pyrolysis approach. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the most um, uh, uh, affordable and, and the largest um, um, effect that we think is important is to look at hydrogen production. Also biochar is important, bio oil, There's, there are many different um, products that we can create. But we, we really want to emphasize about this approach beyond is, um, is that we're valuing the carbon. We want to think about taking the, um, the biomass and not just burning it and creating electrons or electricity, but really using that carbon to create useful products as well as remove it from our atmosphere. Now, if that CO2 then needs to be stored durably, we got to lock it away somewhere. There are a lot of different approaches here, but the main one that we see is um, uh, a big opportunity is geologic storage. And we drew this um, 
um, this drawing to really emphasize how deep we're talking, a mile or two below the surface. And this analysis really looked at um, uh, focusing on geologic basins where that is safe and that CO2 is stored within tiny, tiny cracks in, in, in rock grains. And as that CO2 is pumped below ground, over time it becomes, it mineralizes and actually becomes part of the rock system. And so it, it is safely stored down at that depth. And so our colleagues, Sue Havorka and George Paredes, who is here, did an analysis of not only in two dimensions, where are the right kind of rocks across the US, but what's the volume? What's the top and bottom of that location deep below the surface where we can store CO2? So in this map, when you see the green areas, that means it's a good place for CO2 storage. And we looked not just at can we inject it, but what are the costs to maintain that project over for several decades safely. It's gonna take monitoring, gonna take different folks being on the ground to make sure that there aren't leaks and that that CO2 is staying where we put it. So we included that in the price. And I'll tell you that the numbers actually re remarkably were quite low. They're less than $50 a ton. We can do storage on something like 20 to 50% of the land area in the United States. Now, lastly, I want to talk about direct air capture. This is the other way we can literally suck CO2 from the atmosphere and use a different chemistries, whether they're solvent or sorbent-based, to um, remove that CO2 from the atmosphere and then desorb it and store it below ground. This is expensive. It's energy intensive. And so we insisted that there be local renewable energy purpose-built for any of these facilities. And we found that over 9 billion tons of CO2 can be removed that way. So far more in excess of our goal. We only included about 200 million of those in, our, in uh, getting to the 1 billion goal, but really, again, we could go beyond if we would decide to invest in this approach. Now, because we want to put this on land where we don't already have crops, where we don't have cities, where it's a national park, we really ruled out a lot but we found there are lots of still places where we can produce the renewable energy, do the geologic storage, and build these kinds of facilities. And some of those are here in California, albeit the land is expensive here in California, so it may not be the first place that we choose to do in the country. That's a policy decision. Again, we just provide the data. The cross-cutting analysis that we did to make those decisions on where those DAC facilities should be really took into account a lot of different angles. And I won't go into all those details, here, but the, where is land available? How much water is it gonna take? How much, um, uh, how much, how's it gonna affect air quality? All of those were brought into the analysis. And by the same token, I mentioned earlier that we looked at the effects on equity, on the energy use, on the environment. And this analysis led by Kim Mayfield looked at 26 different indices. And I'm just here throwing, showing you three. I'm showing you the Social Vulnerability Index, which is a metric the government produces that takes into account people's essentially paycheck, their take home, as well as their health. So we valued that index, we valued soil erosion, which we're trying to avoid, and we looked at things like PFAS and different kinds of um, pollutants. Um, PFAS are those forever chemicals that can damage both our health as well as the environment. So we took all of these numbers and created a synthetic um, analysis of where is the application of a carbon dioxide removal likely to have the most um, beneficial effects for those EEJ metrics and the least detrimental effects. And that's what this figure shows. The height of the bar is essentially telling you the potential, the beneficial potential for forests in green, for biomass removal in purple, for DAX in, in blue, and then for soils in yellow. And you can see that they're really evenly distributed across the country which we're very excited to see in the numbers, that it wasn't just disadvantaged communities that were being uh, negatively affected, and, and we weren't just seeing um, benefits for communities that are already um, uh, socioeconomically at the top of the ladder. It was really um, remarkably even across the country. So there are real opportunities here to, to, to lift up and level the playing field. So I'll start to wrap up here by just saying we looked at how at a synthetic level this data coalesced into different regional opportunities. 
There are different um, package of carbon dioxide removal approaches that would likely be, need to be applied in the northeast of the country versus here in the Central Valley. And I'll start to tell you a little bit more just about the California opportunities. You're gonna hear a lot more of that from my colleagues as we go through the day. But I'll just say in, in quick summary that our northern forests, we have huge opportunities to uh, mitigate fire risk by pulling excess biomass out of those forests. That actually makes those forests healthier and they have a likelihood of storing more carbon because they don't go up in smoke. At the same time, that biomass can be used along with the agricultural residues here in the Central Valley and in Merced County to do biomass conversion and carbon removal. There are lots of opportunities to manage soils in the Central Valley. That's something I've studied for some time and I'm excited to do more of. Cover cropping, perennials, to some extent those are already occurring here in the state, but there could be more. Our West Coast cities also produce a lot of municipal solid waste and, and that can be used again for biomass, um, uh, for bikers, for biomass carbon removal and storage. And then finally, in our Sierra foothills and, and then up in the mountains, we know we have additional uh, forest biomass that can be removed to mostly for fire mitigation. So I'll just leave you to try and inspire you for, for the rest of the day that we see enormous opportunities in this, in this country to do carbon dioxide removal. It will be hard work. The solutions are different in different places, and I know that that complexity can be difficult to kind of take on board when you look at these big national maps. So as we go through the day, we're gonna really drill in on what is the opportunity here in California? How would it affect your balance of industries and jobs? And what's the information you can return to us that you can provide because you live here? That's what we're excited to really have in this discussion today. But again, I wanna um, thank my colleagues and, and really um, uh, set you off on this, the road that we have today, but um, this is all of us gathered together. And um, again, many of us are here in the room and we're happy to answer your questions as we go throughout the day. Cheers. Great, thank you. So we have time for two questions. That sounds great, yeah. Great, so two, two questions and then we'll, we'll keep moving. Sir. One second, we're gonna give you a microphone. <laughs> <clears throat> Absolutely spot on. Um, the, the trouble that we have in the forest right now is still NEPA and the lawsuits that prevail. Um, how are we managing that? This is where we get into policy, which is not my, um, my remit, to be honest. And I think that that is something that we're going to have to come together, that the, the state and the nation is going to have to recognize that um, removing biomass can be very healthy for those ecosystems. And I am probably stepping out of my lane here, but I think that some of our current laws are not written with that in mind. That there are opportunities to create additional health by managing ecosystems. And um, the, the importance of um, stopping climate change may overcome some of our previous goals. Yeah. One more. Yes, please. Here. Hi, I'm Yolanda Finchenko with Daybreak Labs. I, my question is related to the definitions of decarbonization and carbon removal. And yeah. I'm just curious how they, I hear both and most of California's policy and funding is around decarbonization. Yep. So how do those intersect? As it well should be, yeah. And I, I know that, that we're a mixed audience here and that sometimes the jargon and the acronyms get in the way. So decarbonization really just means reducing emissions, it's moving away from fossil fuels, moving away from putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, because that's the really the first thing. That's, uh, I'll be blunt, 90, 95% of the goal. And uh, that is, you're absolutely right, that's where the majority of the funding is going right now, trying to use renewable energy moving to electric vehicles, um, transitioning our industries to make things in different ways so they don't rely on petroleum products. So that's decarbonization. And carbon dioxide removal is that last piece that helps us, again, literally suck CO2 from the atmosphere, 
that makes up for the fact that we can't completely decarbonize, we can't reduce our, our fossil use in every sector, or we just likely won't. Um, it's not meant to um, make up for continued fossil fuel use, absolutely not. It's an add-on that makes, um, makes it possible to get to net zero. And I'll be honest that the funding involved is in this sort of a, it's 1% of what the total amount being spent on reducing um, fossil fuel use and emissions is. So it's a, it's a small amount right now. I hope that increases. Thank you, Dr. Petridge. All right, and with that, round of applause.